Listen, friends, I'm going to tell you something right now. I need something. I need something from y'all right now. Get your right hand up in a safe place. Get that right hand up. Let me get that left hand up in a safe place. And on the count of three, we are going to do a thunder clap. And we're going to do one unison clap. We're going to make a big noise. You ready? One, two, three. Did you feel the thunder? Did you feel the thunder? You know what? Let's do a double. Put your hands back up and the, get them in the air. Double thunder clap. One, two, three. All right, friends. Fantastic. You put your hands down. Some of y'all was like, why are my hands still up? It's over. It's over. Why are we doing it? Okay, friends, listen. My name is Mark Thompson. I'm a senior developer engineer, developer relations engineer over at Google working on Angular, and I am joined by somebody fantastic, one of my favorite people to work with. Can y'all give a round of applause for Emma Tversky in the building? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. In, in the building. So, so here's what's happening now. We have the community keynote. And Angular is all about community because here's something that I understood from a very early on time in my development with Angular, that it only goes as far as the community is willing to take it. We can build, the, we can build anything, but if you all aren't there to support it, it doesn't mean anything, so you all drive Angular forward. So give yourselves a round of applause. Y'all yeah. not happy that we're happy for you? That's what I'm talking about. So we're doing a community keynote, which is all about partnerships, all about partnerships. And you all partner with us all the time, and we're so grateful for each and every one of you. I'm going to turn it over to Emma. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, so we are here with the honor and privilege of talking about community. So, Mark, what is Angular Community? I think Angular Community is the people in this room. I think you're very right there. And so since this is the last day of an incredible community gathering of the Angular community, we're going to leave with no regrets. So I'm going to encourage everyone to look at the person to the left and right of you. And they're probably people you already know. And you came with them, and they're awesome, and you probably develop with them all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to encourage everyone to get up or move if you're able to. and. We're going to do a shuffle, and so you have until Mark and I finish doing the Cupid shuffle to find a different seat and maybe sit next to a new member of the community. Again, everyone in this room is awesome. We know that because you develop with Angular, and so everybody get up. We're going to do it. <laughs> Mark, can I get some music for the Cupid shuffle? Yeah, let's do it. Down, down, do your thing, do your thing. To the left, to the left, to the left, to the left, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. Now kick, now kick, now kick, now now walk it by yourself. Now walk it by yourself. Okay, I'm still hearing some noise. Bonus points if you move forward. And so, oh, we actually got the game in shuffle. Thank you, thank you to the music people. Awesome. So you're probably talking to the people next to you. That's very good. But we're going to bring it back up here. All right, on three, let me get a thunderclap. One, two, three. Woo. Can we do a triple? Oh, Emma wants us to get a triple thunderclap. Can we do it? Can we do it? One, two, three. Let's go. OK. Yeah. So now if you look to the left and right, you probably have new Angular community members. And you're not going to say hi now. You're going to turn and say, I'm so sorry. Emma said you can't actually introduce yourself to me right now. But after this community keynote, we're going to spend the whole morning talking to each other. And for now, we're actually going to talk about some community members who aren't in this room. Because there are a bunch of people building with Angular doing super cool things all around the world. So we want to give a shout out to some of the people not here. This summer, we had a student group from Ho San University in Vietnam actually win the Google Solutions 2022 challenge using Angular to build an app uh, called Gateway to create a COVID-19 digital check-in system for their university. So huge shout out to Vietnam. Let's go. Pretty cool Fantastic. that they, yeah. Pretty cool that they used Angular to build that. 
Um, and they aren't the only ones that used Angular over the last couple years to solve COVID-related solutions with Angular. Um, from Harvard's Global Health Tracker to the South African government's vaccine system, we saw Angular used to approach and solve COVID problems in so many different ways. And so huge shout out to everyone doing that sort of critical work. Fantastic. Yeah. Give them a round of applause. And now that we're back in person, we are so excited to be expanding Angular's reach uh, with growing communities in Latin America and Africa and all around the globe. So thank you to everyone who joined from all of those different communities and participates in those local meetups. We are so thankful for those Angular communities. And in fact, we can announce that the Angular team is actually partnering with Google DevFest and will be sharing the latest in Angular updates from ng-conf and future versions uh, this fall. So keep your eye out for the Angular team and version 15 coming this November to a city near you. Yeah, version 15. Pretty cool. So thank you to all of those communities in this room and around the world and spend the morning getting to know, again, this new community around you. So hey, Mark, quick family feud question. Let's go. If I pulled 100 Angular developers in this Angular community, what would their favorite conference snack be? Hmm, favorite conference snack. I need some help, yell it out. What do you think the answer to this question is? Bacon? Coffee, I hear Mountain Dew, coffee. I heard some, my man opened up a pop right now. He said, pop is my favorite. All I heard was bacon. Bacon, yo, listen. Yo, good. so I'm going to tell y'all the true story. This happened to me last night. So I went to go get a cookie during the board game, and then I got ambushed by a bunch of Angular developers trying to get me to try chocolate-covered bacon. And they were intense about it. They were, and they just shoved it with, like, try it, Mark. Eat this bacon. It's good. And I was just like, okay. And it was not good, though. <laughs> <laughs> I did not like it. But you know what is good? I'll tell you what is good. Actually, what's great is our next speaker. Our next speaker comes from Google. He's a senior engineer working on Chrome. And I need you to just give the energy and just bring a lot of love to the fantastic Hussein Jirde from Google. Let's go! <laughs> How's everyone doing today? There you go, all right. Should we get four thunderclaps? I'm kidding, I'm kidding, you don't have to. <laughs> there we go, okay, there we go. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Hussein Jirde, and I'm a software engineer at Google. And I work with the Aurora team, and I like to kick things off by describing what we do. The Aurora team, an initiative, is a relatively new collaboration between Chrome and open source tooling. Our primary mission is to ensure that the web developers always have access to the right tools to build the best possible user experiences. We've worked with and funded many different types of open source projects, but our main focus has been on JavaScript frameworks. Some of our closest collaborations have been with Next.js and Nuxt, where our work has helped land better built-in image optimizations in the framework improved third-party script loading, more performant and less jarring behavior for custom fonts, and even an end-to-end -end conformance pipeline to provide developers with actionable guidance when necessary. You now may be wondering, though, how does Angular fit in our picture of collaboration? Well, we realized pretty early on how important the framework is to the countless developers and companies around the world that rely on it on a daily basis. Angular is a massive ecosystem, and we understand how important it is to ensure that its developers can build powerful and dynamic applications without ever being concerned about shipping poor user experiences. To further highlight how prevalent Angular is in the web ecosystem, Google Cloud Console, a huge application with so much inherent complexity, is built with Angular. From managing resources, processing, and querying tremendous amounts of data, and a whole lot more functionality, the web admin UI of Cloud Console is really a testament to how Angular can be used to build a powerful and intricate application. 
Okay, so we've talked about why it's so important to work closely with Angular to make the framework better for all of its developers. Now let's talk about how. In many scenarios, when you think about user experience and developer experience, it's easy to think of them as two separate entities. One that focuses on what your end users experience when they access your site, and one that focuses on you, the developer, and the experience that you have while building it. When we started the Aurora project, one of the first things that we wanted to do was blur the lines between them. Developers shouldn't have to shift their focus from developer experience to user experience or make trade-offs when they ship features or select their tech stack. Developer experience needs to drive user experience and vice versa. We realized that we found the holy grail of feature when a developer doesn't even realize how much it improves their performance and user experience of their site because they're just too busy enjoying how much faster and easier it's made their development journey. To better understand how we've quantified user experience, though, we'll need to understand the core of vitals or the set of metrics that let anyone measure the user experience of their site and identify opportunities to improve. There's largest contentful paint, an indicator of speed that measures how long it is taken for the largest element on a page to load. Cumulative layout shift, which measures visual stability by calculating the number of layout shifts that occur during a page session. First input delay, which measures how long it takes a page to respond after that first user interaction. And finally, interaction to next paint a still experimental metric that assesses the overall responsiveness of a page by measuring all click, tap, and keyboard interactions. These metrics have and will evolve over time, but we plan to continue working with frameworks like Angular to ensure that the default experience of an Angular site is one that meets all the core vital thresholds where nothing is really compromised. So what have we accomplished already? Well, we've done quite a bit ever since we started our collaboration. For starters, we have the Angular team and community to thank for improving the largest contentful paint metric at a critical point in time. At first, the metric didn't take into account elements that are removed for the DOM, and for the most part, that made sense. You can imagine a site that loads a splash screen before the main content. We wouldn't want that to be the LCP element of the page. However, during server-side rendering, Angular currently takes the approach of rebuilding the entire DOM tree once the required JavaScript is loaded instead of attaching event listeners. After the Angular team and community flagged the problem with how LCP gets measured in Angular apps, the Chrome Speed Metrics team immediately worked on an improved version of the metric and shipped it in Chrome 88. This is a great example of how collaboration with Angular not only helped optimize the framework, but also push forward improvements to the entire ecosystem. In terms of actual framework features that we've worked on together, we helped identify a number of inlining opportunities to improve page performance. We worked with the Angular team to roll out a feature to fetch font declarations and automatically inline them at build time any time Google Fonts is used. This completely eliminates the need for a round trip request, which consequently improves paint times. This was shipped in version 11. And we didn't stop there. We did the same thing for any critical above-the-fold CSS on the page and shipped critical CSS inlining in version 12. One of the biggest features we've worked on with the Angular team that we've been super excited to announce is the new image directive, which is now in developer preview. Optimizing images automatically at build time has been one of our most successful work streams in almost every framework that we've worked with and we're thrilled to see this come to Angular. Minko and Sarah teased this during the opening keynote, but Kara is going to be giving a talk about this in detail at 11 a.m., so don't miss it. I'd like to finish things off by showing all the beautiful faces of the Aurora team. We're a small, tight-knit group, and we're so grateful to have the opportunity to work with the Angular team and community to make the web a better place. Thanks for listening, and a big thank you to everyone in the Angular ecosystem for being so welcoming. Here's to many more years of close collaboration and awesome features. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Hussein. I'm super excited about that image component. And I can only imagine all of the images that this group will be optimizing on the horizon, or dare I say, Aurora. That Next was really up, good. thanks. I was pretty proud of that one. Um, Next up, it is my pleasure to introduce the director of DevRel for Ionic Framework. His bio in Twitter says he's mediocre at best, but I'm going to say he's the best of the best. So I'd like to give a warm round of applause for Mike Hardington. Let's go, Mike. Oh, this feels weird. It's been a while since I've had to do this. So cool. Uh, thank you all. Not Jeff. I am Mike. Uh, we're going to talk about some cool stuff that we've been doing in Ionic re recently. Uh, if you haven't heard about us, we do uh, all the UI mobile. We've been around since the uh, early days of Angular. Uh, we shipped a whole bunch of awesome components. Everything that you, know, you could want for building a mobile app, uh, but all with web technologies. Now, we evolved uh, right along with Angular from the very beginning, uh, migrating to the newest versions every time we have a new release. Uh, but we've also been planning some stuff behind the scenes that maybe aren't focused so much on the JavaScript side, but focused a lot on the components and how the interaction of these components behave. So we recently released a pretty awesome uh, minor release. Yeah, 6.2, that's a minor. Uh, and then it included a whole bunch of awesome features. So one of the biggest ones that I've, I'm excited about is the updated uh, support for Angular 14, which prepares us for all of the uh, great things that we have coming uh, in the future for standalone. Uh, we are following very closely with uh, everything that is going um, on behind the scenes and are super excited to be getting that uh, in the future. But we've been working hard to make sure that the components themselves are not only uh, well-designed, but fast, performant, uh, and most importantly, accessible. One of the really cool ones that we worked on is this nice overlay component, which actually uh, sits on top of your main content and has nice gestures to be able to interact with it uh, and set different breakpoints. So if you want this to only uh, take up half of the screen, you can do that and do it in a declarative way with just a simple Angular component. Another one that you get kind of for free is this uh, navigation breadcrumb component. So up at the top of our app over here, we just get that little, uh, little ellipsis at the top. You can collect that and kind of figure out where are you inside of your app and let your users be able to navigate quickly to previous uh, routes. And then one that the community was super excited for when we shipped it is this uh, improved date time component. Um, I don't need to explain why dates are very complicated. I'm, I hope that you all know that. Uh, try imagining building a component to deal with dates. Uh, there's a lot of opinions on how this can work, so we essentially rebuilt our entire date time component to uh, not only uh, match the new design languages, but also be uh, flexible enough to fit all the different uh, ways that they can be used. Here we have it in line inside of that overlay component. And you can just swipe back and forth between the different months, setting and selecting multiple uh, dates. But it's not only just doing the calendar kind of style uh, date time component. We also have inline components that are uh, able to adjust to different uh, languages. So in this case, this is Tamil. It is a right to left language. So by just setting that direction uh, attribute on your HTML, the date time component can automatically update to account for that without the developer having to do anything. So really nice little things like that that maybe you can take for granted, but for the people who need this, it's good to have. So we have a lot more on the horizon. We are starting our 7.0 planning, which will eventually include uh, all um, standalone components, but we also have another project that has been getting super popular as well. And that's this one called Capacitor. Uh, obviously, we do a lot with web technologies and blending web and native. Capacitor is our approach to doing this that follows all the native best practices that you would expect to get. So we use CocoaPods, we use Android libraries, uh, and we provide a JavaScript API so that way you could access things like the camera, uh, file system, Bluetooth, uh, biometrics, anything that you can, your device can do, 
is a JavaScript API for that. Now, our APIs for this have been pretty streamlined, only focusing on core features that make sense for us to maintain. And we got a lot of requests for one component or one API uh, in particular that we decided to ship. Uh, and that is a dedicated Google Maps plugin. Uh, Google Maps has been probably the map solution for everybody. And while the JavaScript API is great, it can be a little sluggish on especially lower end devices uh, and mobile. So we now have a completely uh, open source Google Maps plugin that will use a native implementation. And all you as a developer has to do is add an Angular component to your markup. And there you go. Uh, the component will automatically manage all this. Yeah. Cool. The component will automatically manage making sure that the uh, app is, uh, or that the maps are not over rendering, and that as you are scrolling inside of your web app, the uh, native map it will follow along and actually track with the, uh, uh, with the web content, really kind of pushing that blurring of where is web, where is native. Now, Mark mentioned uh, earlier that community is super important, and that is true here with us. Uh, we wouldn't be uh, anywhere without this amazing community. And I encourage all of you to get involved and at least try it out. Uh, you can go on to ionic.io slash community, join our Discord, our developer forums, or even hang out on GitHub and maybe send a pull request. That'd be great. Uh, no one wants to send pull requests. Uh, or just tweet at us. That'd be super cool. Um, but with that, thank you. I'm so glad to be back. Oh, let's go. Fantastic. Can we give another round of applause for Mike? Wasn't that fantastic? Woo! It's absolutely fantastic stuff. I'm a big believer in the web, as you can tell, I work on a product that is the web. I remember when Ionic started. Actually, I really do. And I remember when Max was just tweeting. And I was like, how is this thing going to survive? Because I just didn't see the vision. And now seeing it so many years on, it's just really fantastic what they've been able to accomplish. And I'm just grateful that Ionic is a part of the mobile solution for Angular, because we get that question all the time. Like, so when is uh, Angular native coming out? It's not. <laughs> Let that dream go. Don't nobody tweet that. We're not, not working on that. That dream's not happening, but. I'm tweeting that right now. Emma, you better stop it. Okay. All right, friends. So fantastic. So the next up, I would love to introduce somebody else who I think is fantastic. Can we just get our hands warmed up? So I want you to rub your hands together. I want you to warm them up real quick. Because I, I want this applause to be good. Yeah. Listen to that. They're warming up. See, this is for you. So please take those warmed up hands and welcome the fantastic Mike Ryan to the stage. <laughs> All right, good morning. Hey. We're here to talk about NGRX. Woo! Yeah, woo. That's the first NG conf I got a woo for NGRX. <laughs> All right. Everybody's usually like, Thank uh, you. We're starting off strong in 2022. NGRX again. <laughs> here we go. So for those of you who have not heard of NGRX, it's a collection of libraries for building reactive Angular applications. And we help you with everything from state management to side effects to making your component layer just a little bit more reactive. And what I love about NGRX is that it's completely community run. So many of you have helped us make NGRX possible. And it was originally founded by ex Angular core team member Rob Wormald. So this morning, we're really excited to preview a couple of new things that have come out in NGRX over the past year, and also highlight some new things coming up in some future releases. But first, let's introduce ourselves. Hey, I think you've seen my face before, Brandon Roberts. Follow me on Twitter for Brand at Brandon T. Roberts. Best GIFs in the game. And my name is Mike Ryan. You can follow me everywhere at Mike Ryan Dev. Yes. Yeah, so let's take a look at NGRX in 2022 by the numbers. And we've continued to grow, like I said, thanks to the community. We've grown to over 350 contributors, 350,000 developers using NGRX, and we've amassed 20, over 20 million downloads just in the past year. Yeah. Also, with that growth, we've seen one in six Angular apps continue to use NGRX, and this has continued to grow as Angular has continued to grow. So we're definitely proud about that. Hey, look at this. 
Some of these people are here in the audience also. We got Alex in the, group, in the crew here. We got uh, the, the team here, but- Ward, John. Ward, John, definitely. But as you can see, we got a, a good, healthy team here and the team has continued to grow. Uh, many of you have seen Marco Stanimirovich, who's been a contributor of NGRX for a long time and has already been uh, considered part of the core team, but we're just making that official today and adding Marco to the core team of NGRX. Yeah. See, see, Mike, I didn't even, I didn't even have to tell him to clap. That's great. I know, you're right, you're right. You got me, you got me. But yeah, the great part about that is Marco started as a contributor and worked his way all, you know, contributed a lot and worked his way up to the core team, so that's great. So now let's dive into what's new in NGRX. So new in uh, version 14, we're gonna talk about simplified action creation, new standalone APIs, and the official NGRX ESLint rules. Now, Brandon, I was sitting around this morning at breakfast thinking to myself, you know what? Actions are like the bean of the NGRX oh coffee. Oh my gosh, here They're we go. They're essential to writing NGRX applications, and we've made it even easier to write actions in the newest version of NGRX. So if you've been using NGRX for a while, you know that we've come a long, long way in how much code it takes to write actions, but it can still be kind of hefty even with the new create action helper. So in NGRX 14, we're really excited to introduce the new, wait for it, create action group. Way less code to write actions in NGRX 14. Yes, thank you. Are you, are you, are you, turning, to Steve, are you turning to Steve Jobs right now? What, I, mean, what I just feel doing? so excited by how little code you have to write <laughs> actions, my favorite thing. So let's take a closer look at this. With NGRX's create action group helper, now you just give it the source, where all the events are coming from, and then you give it a dictionary of the events that come from that source. It's way smaller to write a group of actions use this new create action group helper. Now if you want to learn more, I've written a full blog post breaking down the TypeScript gluten behind <laughs> NGRX's create action group, gluten. and you can read more about it at liveloveapp.com slash blog. I would love to read that, but you know I'm gluten free, so can't <laughs> Whatever. <do that. laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Great, now we can talk, really talk about uh, something that's been uh, creating a lot of excitement in the Angular, Angular community, and that's standalone APIs. So we are introducing, well, we've introduced these APIs for NGRX state libraries that can you take advantage of these standalone APIs for provide store, or provide state, or even uh, provide store dev tools, router store, and effects, and more. One great thing apart, one thing that we've introduced with effects is that you can use the same provide effects in the root and in feature modules, and it works just the same way. So we're working on simplifying these APIs and looking forward to people taking advantage of those. We've also added the official e uh, NGRX ESLint rules to the library itself. Tim DeShriver, who's on the core team, also maintained this as a separate package before, but now it's just part of the NGRX libraries. You can use this by using just ng-add at ngrx slash eslint-plugin, and this will install the necessary configuration there. And this is also automatically installed when you use ng-add at ngrx slash store. That way we're trying to give you best practices out of the box. And this helps you with common best practices such as avoiding cyclical effects, maintaining good action hygiene, Mike, and more rules like that. So definitely take a look at that uh, if you're using NGRX today or plan on using it in the future. So that's all that's new in NGRX that you can use today, but we have a lot of cool things coming on the horizon that we'd love to get your help with. So we're about to open up an RFC for a new Connect API that helps, it, helps you connect the store to your components with just a little bit less code. We've also completely rewritten our component library for performance, and we're excited about some of the new features that rewrite is going to enable us to land. Finally, we're early into looking at new performance tools to help you build more performant NGRX applications. And with that, we'd like to thank everyone here for joining us, along with our team, our community, and all of our sponsors. Hope you all have a great NGConf. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike and Brandon. There is no easy way to state how cool all of those things were. Okay, thank you, thank you. I see you. Uh, I love hearing about community RFCs. They're a great way to engage with community and you'll see my comment on that one. Uh, next up, it is my pleasure to introduce Anna Boca. Uh, you may not know, but her GitHub uh, profile says that she's a poet, so hopefully getting some rhymes here. But next up is Anna from NativeScript. 
Thank Give a round of applause. Yeah. Oh my goodness, hello. <laughs> Hi again, yes, my name is Anna Boca. I'm excited to provide you a Native Script community update. Uh, so what is Native Script again? Um, in short, Native Script allows you to take a platform API like this, written and provided by a platform language such as Objective-C, and use it naturally within your TypeScript code with blazing fast performance. NativeScript is fundamentally strongly typed through TypeScript. This is made possible by its industry-strength V8-powered JavaScript engine. At the end of 2019, Innovator Progress <laughs> sorry, uh, software provided the entire community the gift of NativeScript. Stewardship of the open source project was led by professional consultants and studio. A sweeping modernization and set of updates with JavaScript standards took place throughout 2020 across NativeScript. By the end of 2020, NStudio inducted NativeScript to, into the OpenJS Foundation and established a technical steering committee to oversee the project. The TSC grew quickly to represent nationalities from around the globe who meet every month to maintain, innovate, and advance NativeScript every day. To name a few, the project represents France, Hungary, Bulgaria, Japan, Indonesia, Ireland, Greece, Brazil, New Zealand, Trinidad and Tobago, Canada, and numerous states across the US here at home. In that time, two major releases have been made. Uh, version 7, which standardized the project from CommonJS to ES modules, and version 8, which standardized with Webpack 5 and delivered long requested features spanning more than five years. So what has the team been doing with Angular? New Angular releases are now operable with NativeScript within a week's time, if not the same day. There have been major optimizations with the Angular integration. And the team has been embracing developer-friendly APIs similar to Angular Material and the CDK. So what makes NativeScript with Angular such a great combo? Natural Angular development, of course. So here we can see view bindings uh, using familiar Angular syntax to markup, which represents the platform in its own natural view experience. NativeScript has also been made available through industry leader StackBlitz. We love StackBlitz. Preview 2.0 allows you to prototype, learn, and experiment with native platform APIs all within your web browser. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, all of this leads to developers being able to create rich platform applications with just their JavaScript skills. <laughs> Let's take a corporate case study as an example with my employer, Universal Plant Services, based out of Texas. I'm going to pass the baton over to my now made famous by Shai Resnick manager, Tim Baldwin. All right. At Universal Plant Services, we've been invested in Angular since the 2.0 beta. We've had many private enterprise apps that we built, including HR, timekeeping, and a lot of field tasks such as safety reporting and tool tracking. We built mobile applications for targeted experiences for our field users and office workers. And our mobile apps were historically hard to maintain and create doing, due to being created in a language other than Angular. All right, you can boo now. <laughs> So to really help take care of that issue, we introduced NativeScript to turn all of our Angular developers into mobile platform developers as well and provide the company with an effective path forward to continue to develop creative and engaging mobile applications. So we've created numerous mobile applications to improve the field and office experiences utilizing Angular architecture. And three mobile apps will be released in 2022. We've already got one of them out, and two are going to be out in a couple of months. 
So uh, one of the other exciting things that we've done recently is we created a private enterprise app store with the Ionic framework uh, to present and deliver mobile apps to our field workers. Uh, and all of our apps are obviously created through NativeScript. So the other exciting thing that we've done is uh, we've automated the mobile app deployments via pipelines in Azure DevOps and without needing a MacBook device. And finally, uh, we've also added AppSync to allow for automatic updates so users don't have to go back to the App Store to get their uh, the newest versions. And the other thing I wanted to make sure that we talked about is that NativeScript and NStudio have really inspired us to do even more than we thought we could do with mobile applications. So at UPS, we are looking for additional Angular architects. So if you're interested in working with us, please email the address up there. Oops. And uh, the other thing we wanted to say is thank you to the community. Uh, Native scripts really expanded in the last few years. And if you get a chance, please go out to the Native Script booth to meet the in-studio team and the UPS team, and we have some demos to show you. Thank you. Owen. All right, right off the bat, right off the bat, you know what I need. You know, that's what I'm talking about, who said that? I want to meet you afterwards. Because <laughs> I was the energy. All right, get those hands up. I need four. I need four. Four. On three. One, two, three. <laughs> Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Can you feel that energy? That's fantastic. I just love seeing how the community and different parts of the ecosystem still provide absolutely outstanding solutions for mobile on Angular. So if you're looking for mobile, you have PWAs already built in. We give you that. Now you have Ionic, you have NativeScript. So your mobile solution is just waiting for you. So go out and build great apps. So next up, friends, next up, let's go. I know y'all got a lot of love for this, uh, for tooling and this group. Yeah, uh-huh, you already know, see? Well, as soon as I said tooling, I already know what y'all are looking for. All right, so I need some energy, a big, big round of applause for the co-founder of Narwhal, Jeff Cross, and architect, Joanna Pierce. Let's go! Thank you, thank you. Uh, I don't know. We just decided who was going to stand on which side, and I don't remember I, I, what I we don't agreed know. on. I, I don't really okay. care. This is good. We, we can just keep swapping around. As we and go. you said you would run the clicker. Oh, God, I get to control this. Okay, great. Hi, folks. How are you doing? Yeah? Great, great, okay. Um, oh, this works, great. Uh, I'm Johanna Pierce. I'm a senior dev and architect uh, with Narwhal. I'm also on the NX Cloud core team. Standing with me here and probably not feeling amazingly well after so little sleep is, and sharing the presentation is Jeff Cross, the co founder and CEO of Narwhal, and ostensibly my boss. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. So don't tell everyone I'm sick then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry. So we'll talk later. <laughs> So we're the company behind NX and Lerna. Uh, if you're not aware of our history, we started this company in 2016 when Victor Safkin and I left the Angular team at Google. And we got to work pretty quickly building NX after that. And more recently, we took over the Lerna project. So now, uh, we, along with those tools, we're, we're maintaining 80% or more than 80% of the monorepo tooling in the JavaScript ecosystem, which I think is pretty cool. I think we do a good job. So we, yeah, let's stay on the thing because it's jarring. Oh yeah, let's, let's step down when we're not talking. <laughs> so we started, let's do that. Yeah. We started building NX in 2017 uh, as an extension to the Angular CLI at first. That, and that's what NX means as a bit of trivia. Narwhal extensions to Angular CLI. And that was my idea for the name, by the way. Uh, NX has developed to include first class support for a range of popular frameworks and tools. We have a thriving plugin community, a dev kit of our own with which you can do code generation and custom task execution. And we're constantly developing new features and uh, plugin support in our labs. Uh, we're also now a fully standalone tool with no reliance on the Angular CLI anymore. 
Uh, in going beyond the Angular CLI, we've developed new concepts like modern Angular, uh, multi-step migrations. We've listened to all of your feedback on the issues of the Angular.json and made it easier to split configuration by projects. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've also developed integrations with new tools as the community has adopted them and provided support for new patterns. Uh, a big pe a reason people move to NX is because it makes things faster. Uh, so in, in the Angular community, the Angular team working on Angular DevKit, they make lots of optimizations to, at, at a low level at how things are built and how, how that can be faster using different builders. We approach it from a higher level. Uh, we, we do things like caching and, and uh, uh, only building parts of your code base that need to be built. And uh, so you get to take advantage of both what the Angular team is doing and what we're doing to, to make meta builds faster. Oh, I forgot you're clicking. So uh, one way we do that, or one, one of the magical things about NX is that we really encourage projects to adopt this project graph, to break their projects, their workspaces, into more granular libraries. And an app in an NX workspace really is responsible for just bootstrapping and configuring a bunch of composable libraries together. And one of the benefits of that is that we get to do things like running affected commands by looking at... Next. Uh, uh, by looking at what like, we compare two commits and we say, okay, what have you actually, which projects have you touched between these commits? And then what projects can directly or transitively depend on that project? Uh, and that's how we say this project could be affected by the change. And you can run, test, build, whatever commands just on those projects so you can save significant um, amounts of compute time. Come back up again. Uh, we've had local computation caching in NX for a while. Uh, the results for any target you run are cached locally and can be retrieved whenever you need to run it again. Now with NX Cloud, we have distributed computation caching. Anyone in your team can pull the results of any successful target that was run anywhere. This really shines in your CI, CI environment and can shorten reruns enormously. NX Cloud also brings the possibility of distributed task execution. We use the knowledge of your project graph and previous run timings to intelligently distribute tasks on CI among as many agents as you can provide. Results are collated by the orchestrator, and you can investigate how many tasks uh, are being distributed via the, via the NX Cloud UI. So there are some obvious benefits to having faster builds. Uh, one of the things is that it's good for the environment. The, the less compute you're doing, the, the less CO2 being emitted from all the data centers doing all this work for you. And since, yeah, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> And uh, well, since we've started measuring with NX Cloud, we, we've calculated that, uh, that the optimizations from NX and NX Cloud have saved, since, the, since we've started measuring, over 200 years of uh, compute time. So, uh, you know, that's pretty good. Come on, that's, that's, that deserves a bigger round of applause. That's amazing. It saves money, too, since you're not paying for that compute time. But, you know, let's be more noble about it. Stop being so greedy, please. So it's, it's not just about features or speed. We, we care about the overall developer experience. Everything we do is about making developer life better. And that's beyond what's in the NX core itself. It's also in how we integrate with the ways developers are working every day. And one example of that is NX console. So this is a VS Code extension. Who has seen this in their VS Code? And you may not even know how it got there. Yeah, that's how sneaky we are. Um, this, but it, it's, it works with Angular CLI, too, and NX, and it uses the, the metadata from your schematics, generators, executors, builders, to show you all the available options for, for different commands you can run. So you don't have to memorize the, the flags, you don't have to remember exactly the format to put things, the console will help you do that, and some more powerful things that, that are more NX-specific in the console. Uh, we currently have a GitHub integration which uh, posts updates to your pull requests, letting you know which targets are successful and which are failing as they complete. We're also working on similar integrations for GitLab and Bitbucket. And if you're curious what your project graph actually looks like, we have a visualization tool as part of NX. With this interactive visualization, you can see everything at once or just focus on an individual project and its dependencies. You can even limit the proximity display to help reduce cognitive load while you're traversing the landscape your code has created. Now, despite having moved on so far from when it was just an extension to the Angular CLI, NX is still backwards compatible, and we have no plans to leave it completely behind. Yeah, that's right. We, yeah. 
And we, we collaborate with, closely with the CLI team, and we use the dev kit still. So you get the best, best of both worlds, the, the goodness that they're working on and, and all the things we're working on. NX is growing at a, a really hard to believe rate, but in the, uh, we're now at 2.5 million downloads per week on NPM, uh, and that's five, point, five times year over year growth. So, I mean, every year it feels like we've reached our peak and it just keeps it on does. going. So, yeah, it keeps getting better. Uh, another uh, interesting milestone for us, and this isn't like, uh, this isn't to say that we're better than Angular CLI, but we do kind of benchmark ourselves against Angular CLI. Um, it's cool, and I used to work on CLI when I was on the Angular team, and so, but it's cool to see that we've now passed the, the um, NPM downloads of Angular CLI, and so it's cool to see that we're at that same level. We're at that same level of, uh, of being relied upon as being a standard in, in the JavaScript community. Um, so well, one of the thing, cool things about how we work is we work with all these great teams, groups, and projects as part of what we're doing. And we, we work with the different communities. We work with enterprises who are actually using these tools. We work with the, the open source maintainers. We get this really well-rounded view into how people are building applications that helps us make NX a better tool, but also helps us contribute back to the community in different ways. Nawalians like myself, uh, yeah, that's what we call ourselves, uh, are invested in the open source community, and we are active contributors to the tools that you all use. Uh, we're also a member of the Open Collective, helping to move the state of JS forward by sponsoring projects that NX depends upon. We've donated tens of thousands of dollars to all these projects. Thank you. And I think you've seen a theme with all the talks today. Community is a big part of it. Everyone, and we have the Angular community, we have other communities we're part of, we have even our own NX community, and there are different ways that you can get plugged into that community. If you go to our, our uh, page on nx.dev, nx.dev slash community, you'll find different ways that you can uh, interact with the community, benefit from work others have done, find out how you can contribute. And, uh, and on that page, you'll also find a link to join our Slack channel. We've got over 5,500 members in here. Shout out to Jay Bell, uh, who started this up and, uh, and is still, still active moderating it, promoting it. Um, uh, our team is in there. We're pretty active. Uh, people go in there. They talk about different topics. Hey, I'm trying to do this with NX. Has anyone done this before? Uh, a lot of great conversations. Uh, so I encourage you to go to our community page and uh, join yeah, that Slack. Go. Sign up. Yeah, we're on that. So, and we've got exciting news that NXConf is coming again in October this year, online and in person. Members of the NX team and the community will be getting together to share what we know with you from Tempe, Arizona. That's right, okay. Arizona, my hometown. You can keep up with the latest in NX news on Twitter at NX DevTools. You can keep up with the Narwhal generally at Narwhal.io. We have a YouTube channel with tips, tricks, and tutorials to help you level up your NX knowledge. Or if you prefer, you can always sign up to our newsletter. But Joe, can you do some poetry for us? Everyone expects well, poetry from you. And OK, I know you've been thinking that all oh, this should rhyme, but that isn't something I'm doing this time. It takes quite a while writing technical verse. There's so much to research. It's almost a curse to be known for just this one thing. So that isn't something I'm bringing right now. But maybe next time, maybe we'll see. I think there could be further angular poetry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna and Mike. I mean, Jeff. Um, you're wearing the same thing. OK. You did the joke. Uh, I'm just calling you out on it. Um, I'll annex my next joke and just introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up, we actually have, again, we were talking about that global community and not everyone is in the room with us, but we're going to welcome a video from another one of our sponsors, Ben Lesh. Ben is a core team member and lead of RxJS. And take it away, video Ben. Hey everybody at ng-conf. Uh, this is going to be a very, very brief update on RxJS. Uh, it's been last minute, so I'm sorry this isn't super well polished or prepared. Um, you can blame Fro Frosty if he's standing over here. If he's over here, you can blame him that way. Um, or just blame Joe. Joe Joe's got broad shoulders. I think, I think you can take it. Anyway, 
Um, so really quick, uh, state of ArcGIS version seven in 2022, the number one thing that I want to get everyone's attention to, uh, and this is, this is super important. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, in, in February of this year, um, we had a release, a patch release going from version 7.5.3 to 7.5.4. So version 7.5.4, check your version of ArcGIS and make sure that you are above that version because as of that version, it, the, uh, every operation through an observable provided that you're sending the same shaped things through the observable, if it's all numbers or all the same shaped object or whatever in Chrome, uh, will be 31 times faster than the previous version. So that's super duper important to know. Uh, I wanna call that out. Please, please check your version, make sure you are up to date. And I've got a series of tweets here from around that time. Um, one of the things that I did is I experimented like, what's the difference between um, RxJS uh, like observable at this exact time and things like async generator, async iterable, that sort of thing. So uh, looking at async generator versus observable, you can see like observable is much, much faster. It's much faster than just a generator. It's almost, it's, it's a little faster than your hand rolled iterator if you were to make one of those and it's, you know, just callbacks, still gonna beat it, but Honestly, this is uh, going over like a million items, or I think it might have that have been a typo. This might have even been 10 million items, just spitting it out as quick as it could. And um, you know, the the difference here of, of four milliseconds is pretty minuscule. So observables are very very fast as of 7.5.4 and up, um, which is a very good thing. So make sure you're on that version and higher. Uh, I highly recommend that. Otherwise, let's talk a little bit about uh, where we're at with version seven. So here you can see, this is all the stuff we wanted to accomplish in version seven before we moved on to version eight. And we are just about done um, deprecating this. I think there's already a PR standing outstanding for that that just needs to be merged in. And then we've got um, this uh, duration selector issue, which should be pretty small. Uh, that is honestly just more of a bug than, than anything we do for a minor. So we're not looking at doing any more um, minor releases of RxJS for this, for version seven. We're going to probably only do patch re releases from here on out. So version seven is steady. It's in, in support mode, just like version six. And we want to move on to version eight. Um, in version eight, and this is, this is a really, really big deal, I think, in, in my opinion, and we've decided this isn't to be determined anyway, it's actually gonna happen. Uh, but we wanna implement uh, async iterator on observable, which means you'll be able to consume observables in four await loops in async functions. Uh, I can show an example of what that means in a little bit. The other thing I wanna call out is we're gonna try to move everything over to a mono repository and split things out into different packages. What that means for you is effectively nothing. Uh, RxJS, the main package will remain as is, but it's actually going to be importing smaller packages and re-exporting things. And the reason for that is we've had a reasonably high demand for people that want an observable but don't want all of RxJS with it. So uh, various libraries and stuff have like expressed concern that they were using some poorly maintained, poorly written version of an observable and that it wasn't compatible with RxJS's observable or wasn't the same as RxJS's observable. A lot of their users were using RxJS, but they didn't want to get the whole kitchen sink of RxJS into their library. Um, They're worried about people not having tree shaking or whatever. That's fine uh, because we want to publish, and this is very important to me, uh, publish a, a standalone version of RxJS observable. So you'd be able to just pull in the observable and use that if you don't want to use all the operators, that sort of thing. Um, but otherwise, again, the regular RxJS uh, um, package will remain the same. You'll be able to import what you need from that. Uh, should be fine. The other thing we want to do in version eight is we want to remove all the deprecated APIs. So some of these things have been sitting around for up to six years now. And so it's time for them to go. Uh, we're also dropping any Internet Explorer support, which there isn't a lot of very specific things. So we have some 
Ajax libraries that the Angular folks probably don't care about very much, but uh, dropping support for those, um, which I'm super excited about. And we're only going to be publishing the latest, uh, the latest uh, uh, ECMAScript version. So this is ES 2021. By the time we get it out, it might be ES 2022. Uh, but that's all the important stuff that we're looking uh, for version eight. Now version eight, we have alphas of it right now probably won't go into beta for another couple months and probably won't come out of beta until I'd say the, the end of the next, first quarter next year, maybe second quarter. It's all volunteer team. Uh, there isn't a ton of work to here to do, but there, there is some kind of moving things around in our repository that's going to take a little time. We want to get steady before we move forward. So that's the state of RxJS. Um, I'm going to stop my share and I want to thank you all for listening to this. Uh, please, 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 super important. Look at your projects, make sure that you're on it, at least on some version seven of RxJS. That's a big deal. You want to, you want to get there as soon as you can. And you especially want to get to version seven, five, four and above because it is so much faster than the previous versions. Uh, if you missed announcements last year or the year before or whatever, version seven also uh, is, I don't even remember, something like 50% of the size of version six as far as the size within your bundle. So just that update alone is going to help speed up load times and stuff like that. So please, please, please update uh, your RxJS packages. Thanks, everybody. So what are y'all going to do when you get back to your laptops? What are you going to do? To what version? <laughs> y'all don't even know. Someone said six. Seven. You know, in honor of making sure that we all get that update for RxJS to at least version seven, I'm going to ask you for something. You already know. You already know who I am. You used to it. Go, go, go ahead, say it out loud. Seven thunderclaps. Seven thunderclaps. Get those hands up in the air, we want, it can't be done, we're gonna see. Let's do it together, seven on count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> now, what did I hear, okay. eight? <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, so this is my first NGConf, I'll be honest with you. Watching it online was not the same, but I was like, oh, these are some really nice people. They seem so nice in the, you know, on the screen. But being here in person is just absolutely fantastic. You all are absolutely fantastic. Give yourselves a round of applause. Woo! And NGConf isn't even possible without the hardworking organizers. Can we give them a round of applause? And speaking of, I want, I want, to, I want y'all to just get ready for it. Get, rub those hands together, get them warmed up. Yeah. I want to hear that sound. Let's see. Yeah. Give a huge round of applause for everybody's favorite hero dev, Mr. Joe Eames. <laughs> hey, everybody. How's it going? Um, I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite tools. I'm sure it's everybody's favorite tool, Protractor. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's talk about Protractor's future. If you're up to date, you'll, you're aware that Protractor is going to be end of life in August 2023. <laughs> the Angular team is going to support it until then. but. The reality is that even though there are tools that we are ready to move past, we have a lot of investment in them. There are a lot of companies represented by developers here and across the world who have significant investments in Protractor. So I'm really excited to announce that HeroDevs has partnered with the Angular team, and we're gonna be providing support for Protractor until at least August 24, 2024, so you can still get critical fixes and updates in your Protractor test will still run and give you a little bit longer to make that migration that you've been probably trying to make for a long time. You can head over. Yep. 
You can head over to herodevs.com slash support slash protractor for that, uh, for information about that. Now, <clears throat> we talked about, I, I mentioned that we have a significant investment in Protractor. We have a lot of tests. There are a lot of people out here who have significant quantities of Protractor tests, and you've probably had that experience where you've tried to move away from Protractor to some awesome tool like my personal favorite, Cypress. And in that attempt, you've discovered that it is a huge problem. It's a huge pain in the butt, and for some reason, management doesn't seem to think that it's that big of a deal. And so you start the project and you're doing it maybe in your free time or your spare time at work and you get a little bit far and suddenly you're trying to run two end-to-end two -end systems in your CI pipeline and that starts being a problem and maybe you end up in maintaining two versions of the same test and that's a problem and these sorts of things are the types of situations that go for a month or two and then they just get abandoned because they realize, you realize how much effort it's actually going to be to do what needs to be done and then you're back stuck with using something that you know isn't ideal and you wanna be using something awesome like Cypress, but you can't. Now, for example here, I've, uh, ooh, this is not displaying, here let me, uh, let me fix this, there we go. For example, I've got here just a typical set of tests, right? Written in Protractor. To rewrite this test and all the other tests that are around it uh, in Cypress is a, a fair amount of effort, right? And we start that process and we, maybe we do some, a couple of search and replaces, but that just breaks a bunch of tests and it's a real problem. It's so hard to move those tests over to a, a more modern tool. What would be so awesome is if we could get going on the new tool and have everything working and then slowly migrate, but only be using one tool at a time. But unfortunately, it's not as easy as just grabbing all of your tests and dragging them up into your Cypress test folder and heading over to Cypress and clicking on one of your specs to run it because we all know that you can't run unmodified protractor tests in Cyprus until now. I'd like to introduce to you Enbridge. What you saw is exactly what you think you saw. Those are truly Protractor syntax tests, so here's that test running inside of Cypress. If I change and break this test and head back over to Cypress, my test is now broken and I can now use Cypress's visualizer to walk through and see what's going on, check out the various pieces of this, I can pin, I could do everything that Cypress can do with my Protractor tests without modification. Now this does raise a few questions. First off, is there some weird thing going on? Is Protractor running inside of Cypress? No, this is just Cypress. I can now uninstall Protractor from my project. We get every Cypress benefit using this method. We can write all of our new tests in Cypress and do that thing where, hey, let's just leave alone what we've got and we'll do our new stuff in the new tool and then eventually work back and clean up the old stuff. We can keep writing our protractor syntax if we have to, if that makes sense. It doesn't, <laughs> but it might. And you can run both protractor and Cypress syntax side by side inside of Cypress. You can also use the things like page objects. You don't have to modify those. They're just gonna still run exactly the way they run in your Cypress syntax. In your Cypress syntax. And of course, this works with everything. If it's written in Protractor, it now runs in Cypress. Whether it's an Angular project, a React project, a vanilla JS project, or an old Angular JS project, as long as it's just written in Protractor, it now runs in Cypress. So how can you use Enbridge? Well, it's actually in beta, so we are looking for beta test partners. If you're interested in beta testing with us, head over to enbridge.dev, 
and you'll, head, you'll end up at the Hero Dev site and you can sign up to be a beta test partner and help us work through our beta process until we're ready for release. And on the off chance that Cypress isn't your uh, preferred end-to-end -end testing tool, we are uh, looking for future, working towards future support for Playwright, Nightwatch, and other tools. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joe. We introduced you as our hero, but truly I think you just became a lot of people in this room's hero for that. That was really cool. Give it another round of applause fantastic, for Joe. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, fantastic. Very excited. As you know, the Angular community cares a lot about backwards compatibility. We talk a lot about it. Truly, that was mind blowing. And again, that was our last speaker, but thank you so much. Angular truly exists because of viewers like you. Everyone in this room is Angular community, and as you saw today, there are so many thriving community projects because of all of the development work you all do, so thank you. And I just want to say thank you again for welcoming us. I joined the Angular community a couple of years ago you know, when I joined Google, and I felt so welcomed by everyone, and then being in the building, feeling so welcomed. And we just want to encourage you to continue to be that welcoming community, because as we mentioned in the beginning, Angular is only as strong as the community and as strong as you are, and you folks are absolutely fantastic. So I want to ask for one last thing from you. This is the last one. Thunderclap. This is the last one. <laughs> yep, get them up. <laughs> we, got, uh, we got something coming up in November. Anybody know what's coming up in November? V15. Okay. <laughs> so to, to say goodbye from us, we want to do 15 thunderclaps on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> I had to count that. Thank you so much. You've all been fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Mark, that's Emma. Enjoy the rest of the conference.